Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 603rd episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Water is one of the things we need multiple times a day. And as it gets hotter and drier, we need to become a lot more aware of where our water comes from and where it goes. Plus, when we're growing food, we're going to need to think about where we're getting our water from. People are surprised when they learn that I collect rainwater for my garden, even though I live in the desert of Phoenix, Arizona. What most people don't know is that you can harvest a lot of water. For example, it only takes one inch of rain on a thousand square foot collection area, such as the roof of your house, to collect 600 gallons of water. That's why you don't need to live in a wet place for water harvesting to be a viable self-sufficiency tool for your house and garden. If I can do it in Phoenix, then you can do it no matter where you are, especially if you live in a wetter place than where I do. Learning to harvest your own fresh water means you don't have to rely heavily on your area's municipal water supply. You can be in control of the inputs into your garden and stop watering your plants with chemically treated water. If you're ready to up-level your garden game and explore all the possibilities of harvesting water, you'll want to attend the Urban Farm U's upcoming online water harvesting summit this June 15th through the 17th. This three-day event features visionary speakers sharing their expert knowledge on topics like rainwater harvesting, gray water harvesting, subsurface irrigation, building healthy soil to hold more water, and more. The 2021 Water Harvesting Summit is free to attend, and you're going to learn the best techniques for watering your garden and saving water. And I have a little surprise in store for you when you sign up. To reserve your spot in the summit, head over to waterharvestingsummit.com and get ready to create the self-sufficient life of your dreams. Today is Farmer Friday, a quick and dirty tidbit at growing your garden. Each episode will feature less than 10 minutes of essential content for growing your garden, and some episodes we will answer your questions. If you have one, send it to questions at urbanfarm.org. Today, we're talking with Marlene Simon with the Flower Power Garden Hour podcast about how to spot beneficial predators in your garden. Enjoy. Welcome, Marlene. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, you bet. This is one of the topics that I can't tell you how excited I am to talk about because I often will get people that will say to me, oh my God, there's this bug in my garden. How do I kill it? And until we know whether it's a beneficial or not, we don't want to do that, right? Yeah. And and even then we may not want to kill it if it's a bad bug necessarily, right? Because right? yeah. we know we've got good bugs somewhere in there and bad bugs are food for, for good bugs. But yeah, I wish I could save all the ladybug larvae out there. When I get questions and people send me the ladybug larvae, they're like, is this a bad bug? (laughs) I I jump on it. I'm like, no, it's a good bug. So I think most people, most gardeners are aware of what, you know, ladybug is. I think most are aware of what a ladybug larvae looks like. Mm -hmm. You know, it looks like, I call it, looks like a little dragon. It does, right? (laughs) Yes. Yeah. So, you know, it's black and red. Yes. That's what I've heard. I've never been bit personally. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to take offense to that. I would love to be bit by one, but (laughs) yeah. And then, you know, as it starts, you know, pupating, it becomes hard on the leaf and sort of gets smaller and smaller and starts forming into that beetle shape. So I think most people are aware of, aware of the ladybug larvae. And of course, you know, ladybugs eat bad bugs. And then there's also the praying mantis egg sac, mm, which mm-hmm. sometimes throws off people because it's not always necessarily even on plants. I've had some on my patio furniture right. where it looks like someone sort of spit and it dried. <laughs> <That's the best. laughs> You know, it's this beige sack that looks quite alien-like, but, Uh you know, there's your praying mantis. So that's something to look for if you see this unique beige hard. You know, of course, you don't want to push it too hard. Just, you know, you don't want to bust through it. So those are two that I think most people are aware of. But there's some other signs to look for to see if you actually have beneficials working for you. And one that I want to discuss is if your aphids have been parasitized. There are parasitic wasps, and we're not talking about, you know, like paper wasps 
and the wasps that we could see readily, very small wasps. And what they do is they will go to a live aphid and they will lay their eggs inside the aphid. It's, it's quite brutal. Mm -hmm. It's quite interesting. And so if you're looking and you see all these aphids, you know, there's different colored aphids and you might not even notice. But if you happen to see ones that are extra large and beige, it's the best thing I could tell people to do is get a hand lens and go out and inspect really close to your leaves and see what's really going on at the bug level. Right. You know, we're seeing it from, from our point of view. If you notice beige, large, what they look, they do look like aphids, but they're not moving. You might notice, or you should notice if they're parasitized, an exit hole and realize that it's just a shell of the of the aphid i've and seen you know those you before yeah yes it's because it, they don't fall off it, and it's not like the parasitic wasps will eat the aphid and like a ladybug would they're using them as a host and of course you don't want to spray even and i have to stress this enough even organics even natural sprays like your soap sprays and your neem oils if you spray them on a sensitive parasitic wasp you could kill it. Yeah. So, you know, if you see signs of this, let it be. We all know aphids dissipate, you know, once spring starts rolling through, yeah. other predators attack them. So they generally aren't that, usually aren't that big of a problem. But yeah, look for that parasitized wasp at in where I work at the conservatory. We have an established a group of wasps. And one of the main ones is Aphidius colmanii. And I think I pronounced that wrong, but that one is native to North America. And you probably won't see the wasp, but do look for that parasitized body. Another one I want to mention is the mealybug predator, uh -huh. or they call it mealybug destroyer. <laughs> it's, it's a beetle, uh, Cryptolamus, but the larvae form looks just like a mealybug. Oh, wow. So if, you know, so if you're looking and you see a cluster of mealybugs, white, fuzzy, but you see one that might be a little bit bigger and might have its filaments a little less organized. Uh -huh. Look at it closely. That it might be a mealybug predator attacking the mealybugs. So you definitely don't want to spray that with anything. They are out and about. We release them in the conservatory in hopes of getting you know them established um, inside the conservatory. So that's just another one to look out for. Another one I want to mention that it's a little more rare, but I have seen it outside is parasitized white fly eggs. Oh, wow. So, you know, people usually treat white flies or try to treat them, I should say, after exactly. they see the adult. It, yeah, you want to get to them before. So you do want to inspect their eggs or these clear disc shapes underneath the leaf. And if you can knock those off with a hose blast, or anything, you know, you'll cut down the life cycle. But if you turn that leaf over and you notice some that are dark, where the other ones are clear, it's very possible that is Incarcia formosa, which is a parasitic wasp, doing the same thing that the parasitic wasp will do to the to the aphid. It is injecting its eggs into there. So like I said, it's not as common, but uh -huh. I have seen it. I have seen it around. Wow. So so these are just a few things, you know, that we're all sort of just in tune to see the ladybugs, see the adult lace wings, but there's things that we don't, can't see with the, the naked eye and really don't pay attention to that really is, it's happening. It, it, it's a war in your plants sometimes. <laughs> right. You know, we look at these flowers, we look at these plants and we're like, wow, it's, it's, oh, it's so peaceful. And then you look closely and you see these, you know, things parasitizing each other. So brutal garden. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so lace wings are also good. Yes. Yes. So lace wings. Yes. Yeah, so and most people know the lace wing adults. They're very pretty. They're very distinct. The green with, you know, their name comes from the fact they have very large wings and they're see-through. Mm -hmm. And, but it's actually the larval stage that is more brutal than the adults. The adults can, I believe, eat some bad bugs, but the larval stage, and we're talking about the ladybug larval stage, uh -huh. lace wing state larval stage is very similar in shape, like a little, what I picture a dragon, but it's more of a beige brown uh. color. So if you see something that's shaped like a ladybug larvae, elongated, crawling around, but it's beige, then that is a lady, uh, a lace wing larvae. And their eggs are really interesting too. They're distinct too, because they lay an individual egg on a long stalk uh -huh. underneath a leaf. 
So instead of being flat on a leaf, they're on filaments. Oh, so it's oh, very distinct. Right. I've to seen see. those before. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you Google a picture or, uh, of lace wing eggs, and it's it's like these little teardrops on these long filaments. So like, not directly on the leaf. So those you want to look for that as well. Like on, the, on a when you say a filament, it's like it's on a hair, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. like cool. a structure, not just flat on a leaf. So right. yeah, you definitely don't want to knock those off if you were to see them. So yeah, just remember that insects have different stages. Yes. And so if we're used to the adult stage, you got to look for all the stages. Right. Well, one of the things that I've noticed for me, I've been organic for thirty-two years on my property here. I don't mm-hmm. have a bug problem. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I don't even consider myself having a bug problem yet. I have bugs because I just consider them food for my, my good bugs. Exactly. Um, yeah. I, I, and it's, you know, your farm, you, you have your hedgerows, you have lots of covering for the, the good bugs. Mm-hmm. You have a healthy ecosystem. You haven't gone in and sprayed anything I imagine. And that's, In 32 you know, I, years. I, I, yeah. And there's really no need to, if, Sometimes if, you know, I have aphid problems here and there, and sometimes I just go, okay, that's going to be the crop or the plant you attack and we'll we'll work with it. I'm not going to, you know, and then I'll look over and there'll be a whole bunch of ladybugs on it. One of the things I noticed about in the desert is that the ladybugs show up at the end of a life cycle of a plant. So like people will reach out to me in March and April and say, my broccoli is covered with aphids. Well, you should have harvested your broccoli in January and February, and <laughs> it's going to seed now. And of course, the aphids are after it because they play a purpose. Yeah. They play a purpose in the world, and that's to break down plant material. Yeah, so. yeah. I always let my broccoli go to flower for the bees too. Of course, so I always yes. But yeah, I get that a lot with my my artichokes. Oh yes, towards the end when mm-hmm. and but yeah, it's interesting. And you know these these quote bad bugs, a lot of times they'll go to stressed plants right so exactly. if, if you have a if you have an unhealthy garden or a you know stressed garden you're going to have more bugs so if you make your garden happy and healthy you're going to have less bugs for that reason as well amen so it's yep make healthy soil makes healthy plants exactly more bug resistant well thank you so exactly. much for joining me today marlene you have a podcast tell us about it Flower Power Garden Hour, and it's not always an hour, but I do like to sort of go, I, I like to talk a lot, and the guests I have on are always very interesting, so I, you were on, talking about permaculture yep. and your farm. So it's all about all topics, vegetables, flowers, houseplants, beneficials, it's really anything that's plant-related, I like to talk about it. Nice. Yeah. yeah, it's on all the platforms, Apple Podcasts, Google, Stitcher. I have it on my YouTube, Marlene, the plant lady. So yeah, you could find it there. You're on Facebook and Instagram, Marlene, the plant lady, right? Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.